keep it as a way to clear your name. Yeah, a way to get you into her good graces. Her good graces. I'd rather get into her coffers myself, but... Or her pants. <laughs> so, you two go to trail them and you stealth an agility roll. Oh, yeah. And Kale will automatically spend a success to pass it. Should I just send, spend a success? It's up to you. I mean, I tend to not roll very well on my stealth rolls. Yeah, that's a weird thing considering how, how, how high that roll. skill is. It's like a six. I should be doing better, and yet I always roll bad. Um, What's your agility? It's a, uh, my agility is only three. Still, that's pretty. That's, that's still average. Yeah. So let's see, six. That should be rolling on column nine. Mm. Um, Plus, it's a one die six because that's one of your chief skills, right? Say what? No. No, no it's not. Okay, no. so it's still column nine. So yeah, as long as you roll like a like huh? a seven or like a. Where are you getting column nine from? My, I'm rolling a column six. She's talking about her agility and her stealth all together are six. Oh, yeah. okay. Because my agility's three. And so the skill level is just three, so it's called six. Okay, so yeah, it's still eleven or better, you should be fine. Yeah. What was it? I can't see from here. That's a fumble. Oh, yay. Okay, so Vali does not make it. They see you trailing them, and they would say something about it and maybe accost you, but you have the big Sumerian with you. So they just kind of like sit still and see which way you want to go. Kale says to them, Well, you dogs, do something. One of them says, we admire your determination for the job, but as I said, we no longer are interested in doing business with you. Please leave. Well, I fucked up, so I doubt they can trail him now. So, yeah. But he will... Could you pay one of the kids to trail them? You grab a street kid and say, hey, follow yeah. them, come back. Hey, I'll follow them and tell them where they're at, and I'll give you, like, whatever okay. my fine. I'll follow that later. The next morning rolls around. Three silver. You all awaken. Mm. You awaken with the girl. Mm -hmm. Who is two. looking at you just like amazed. Mm. Ready for round four? <laughs> <laughs> Got it. Frey was entertaining herself that morning. Mm. Volley. You did not seek out companionship? No. Okay. He was probably busy with, like, other stuff, bookkeeping and all that. Waiting for okay. the kid to come back with information. Yep, yeah, it seems. Waiting for word from Marcellus as well. So. Okay. I am going... Excuse me. I'm going to rule that uh, Iskandar and Kale basically ended up together that night. Because yeah. she's got to do it with somebody, so he's there. Hmm. And plus keeps him calm. Our serving people in the hovel come in and knock on your all's doors. They present you breakfast. They skip Freywin's room because none of them really wants to see that. <laughs> what do you all do? Well, I got to go hit the doctors after uh, saying goodbye to the young lady. What's her name again? She was a random NPC, so I didn't bother to write it down. Uh, let's call her... Let's call her Rakina. Okay. Well, I'll let Rakina know that whenever she... That uh, she's always welcome. <laughs> okay. And I'm always willing. She's like, I need an escort to go back home. Be happy to walk you home. It's probably best if it's a man. Yeah, if you insist. I'll get one of the terrain. Well, just, you know, two women in the street, someone might jump us. She has no idea. <laughs> you did see what I did last night, right? You were very fortunate the gods smiled on you, but That's you are normal. just a woman. I used to fight in the arena, and I never lost. Really? Squeeze the scars and the muscles. Okay. <laughs> you spend the morning walking her home. Volley? Uh, I don't know. Whatever his normal routine would be, I guess. Since they don't really have a lead. Did the kid get back? As I said, we're going to follow that up later. Okay. Okay. Anyways, after I get done walking uh, Rita home, I'm with uh, was it Rakina? Rakina. Rakina. Let's get done walking Rakina home. I am going to hit the doctors and find out 
how badly things how bad things are there. So Sebek pulls you aside when you arrive to a small antechamber. He looks very grave and grim, and he says to you, all of them, except Seti, the older daughter, mm -hmm. the older sister, have signs that they're infected. Can you keep her from being infected? That's why I'm, that's why I'm concerned, because they should all be infected. Hmm. I've been asking some gentle questions, and Seti says that she wasn't at home for the last few days. She's busy working. Which makes me think there might be something in the house that's infected them. Well, the house is, getting, is slated to be burned down. Do you wish to... Without any idea of what infected them, it could... Think of cholera, how cholera gets into the water. Mm-hmm. We have to be sure that this doesn't get into anything else that could contaminate anybody else. Without knowing what it is, that pr that chance still lingers in the air. Would you want to inspect the house? Do you think that's safe? Yes, I think that would be advisable. But um, not quite sure how to tell the girl who isn't sick that she's going to watch all of her family members die a painful, gruesome death. Well, how they die is up to her. Okay. She has to make that call. So he goes in and has that conversation. And it goes about as well as you would expect. Lots of crying, lots yeah, of sobbing. This is one of my cultural blind spots for this character. She just doesn't get the idea that this would be a traumatizing Lots thing. of blaming the gods. Why is that? Why you abandoned mm -hmm. us? Blah, blah, blah. Mm. Wailing and gnashing of teeth. She's like, let me go talk to them. She's like, mm. and he's like, no, I'm sorry, I can't. They have to be sequestered. Please let me see them. No, I can't do that. And she keeps trying to get to them, and finally he looks at Nui Chu, and Nui Chu takes her and restrains her. Yeah, well, uh, you can't see them, but you can't talk to them through the door. Okay, and to speed things up, because this is a foreshadowing of a later adventure in the story. When you get to the property, you spend a good part of the morning investigating it, and Sebek Amon does not find what could have infected them. But he keeps toying with the idea that was something in the food or the water. So they didn't po Who would poison a no one family? He doesn't know. But that's the only conclusion he can come to because he can't find any other he can't find any other obvious source of infection. Because it's clearly not sexually transmitted. Yeah, obviously. Otherwise the whole damn city would be dead. Um <laughs> <laughs> to get kicked. <laughs> anyway. All right. The so, only thing I can think of is that somebody in this family saw or heard something and somebody felt the need to wipe them out. Mm. Or it's just a sick, twisted experiment. Okay. Considering how many wacky, so twisted sorcerers and alchemists are running around this freaking country, that doesn't surprise me either. Mm. Yeah. He's sound asleep too. Like being a Apparently. Apparently. He's just totally calm now. <laughs> My dog is that she's asleep but her eyes are still partially open. Yeah, they do that all the time. So does he. I hope it's a good dream. <laughs> I don't know if dogs have nightmares or not. Well, they do. Because I've heard whimpering and whining, like, sometimes scaring shit out of her. Well, well, sometimes dogs make those sounds when they're having fun, too. Uh, no, Mine does. Not, not that kind Mine does. It looks actually kind of vaguely disturbing with her eyes on you. Okay, well, we're getting away from you. <laughs> Anywho. Uh, all right, so the next morning is Kanara comes down and says, you know, I have workmen coming there um, to my studio. We have things that should be all and up by the end of the week, but I feel like we still need some backers, and I am obviously going to need a clientele or we won't make it through the first month. Oh. Do we have any strategy for attracting people? Well, we do have a certain nobleman whose coffee plantation we saved. You could spread the word. Biel Hotar does not seem like the kind of person to me that gives a crap about the fine arts. And... But Joshua Shing does. And if Biel Hotar puts a word into Joshua Shing's ear... Mm -hmm. Why don't we just go talk to Joshua? He knows oh. us. 
True, we could True. do that too. We could do that, but like I said, Bell owes us. Let's go talk to the slimy Shemite again. And we'll talk to Jail as well. Because I think Bale giving us a word in with him would be a good thing. Give us a little more weight. That day you walk across the streets of Arjun to Balevatar's Manor. When you arrive, there are coaches outside. Hmm. And the coaches have various noble crests on them, so apparently he's entertaining fine guests. Ah. Okay. Oh, great. That's going to make things long and tedious as we wait. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Hmm. Perhaps we should go through a servant's entrance and wait for him to discreetly come to us. No, I agree. I'm just thinking, yeah, yeah this is going to be a long, tedious yeah. wait. Okay, let's go through and then I we'll guess we'll let the servants... The gate guards recognizing you admit you to the servant's area. You're in the servant's area, particularly you're in the kitchen. Oh, and people are going true. about cooking food, storing food, doing things you normally see in kitchens. Slaves are chopping food. And halfway through it, you hear a roar from an adjoining room, about bringing him his tea. You can hear Bale's voice just faintly. Hmm. Okay. okay, so the beached whale wants his tea. <laughs> this canard takes the tray from the slave and goes, I think we should go introduce ourselves. Okay. It's yeah. being rude a little bit. Okay. You walk down the hallway to the room where he's at. You walk in, and in the middle of that room, there's a bunch of pillows and things laying on the ground. Bale, a couple of slaves, a noble, another couple of slaves, the other noble, a couple of slaves are all in a ring. And I shall not describe what's going on, but you can imagine um, from the first time you met Bale what might be going on. They're having an orgy? Yeah, pretty much. Okay. And the two nobles, seeing you all enter and realizing you're not his normal servants, look at him a little concerned, and he waves it away. You two walk in, and he's like, what are you guys doing here? Eh, we just came in. We just wanted to ask a favor. Ask it quickly. I'm in the bill. I'm in the middle of some delicate negotiations. Oh well, Miss Gennaro. I need patrons for my school, and I was hoping you'd be kind enough to tell Joshua we could use his help. Oh, please, that prude. He is doing something I don't care. Apparently, they're having another spat. <laughs> oh, Jesus Christ. <laughs> well, this canard is very good at... Where can we find him? He's probably in some museum or court. He may have even had a audience of a mayor today or something, if I remember correctly. Mm. Thank you. Here's your tea, Bale. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. Takes the lotus-laden tea off into the corner. As he leaves, this canard looks at you and goes, Women. <laughs> <laughs> to which Kale say, my line. I say it better. <laughs> and the party's basically going to track down Josh Oh, yeah. yeah. All right, that's where I was trying to get y'all to. Mm -hmm. So the mayor's... uh governor, actually. The city would have a mayor, wouldn't it? That's a... That's a that's a Euro strictly European medieval thing. Fine. Whoever's in charge of the city's palace <laughs> is in that palace holding court. People coming, giving him misses. He's making judgments. He's telling certain nobles what they can and can't do. And basically, you have guy in the center, his guards, everyone around him, standing around, yelling at him, wanting attention, and one at a time coming up and being heard. And in the back of all this, there's Joshua standing against the post. When he sees you all enter, Joshua waves at you. Hello, my friends. What is it today that brings you here? Yeah, actually, it's you. Oh? What can I do to help you? Yeah, let's get a uh, young lady here, let's get right. She's uh, opening a dance studio and yeah, needs some patronage. Excellent. I'm sure many of the noble women of Arjun could use your coaching for dancing before their god. And you can tell that when he said that Joshua doesn't think much of Zap. Yeah, well, I'm not much unfortunately for bugs either, but yeah, mm -hmm. hey, whatever makes the locals happy. <laughs> In fact, I know of something happening later this evening in which would be a good point, a good chance for you all to meet several of these patrons. A young family on the way up, um, the Rutas, are having a dance this evening and also like a soiree slash get-together. 
Savos Ruta is the young man who's in charge of the family at the moment. And I say young, but he's actually in his 40s. And he's made it known that he's looking for entertainment. If I recall correctly, he is short a band. Perhaps some dancers, he points to Iski. And his Karnara says, I'm sure I could get Pradaj and his men to be my accompaniment, and I'd be more than happy to dance for the nobles of Turin, uh, nobles of Arunjun. Mm. She then turns to the party, but that will mean they will know my face. That's why you do. That's why you wear a veil. Okay. Very well. I'll let him know that there's a veiled dancer that would be happy to entertain, and that, well, dear, if you're going to open a school, they'll know your face anyway. And then she realizes the downside to her plan. Mm -hmm. She's like, mm. yeah. I'll just yes. stay veiled when we go on jobs. Okay. Okay. Mm. All right. I look forward to meeting you there. He gives you the information. We're actually going to call a game there for the evening. Here, boy. Here because uh, the rest of this can get a little... Convoluted? Not only convoluted, but it starts leading into the dungeon crawl section. And I really uh, want to have Raymond here for that. Okay. Yeah, We're going to call it there for now. Write down that. what chips you have. Oh, okay. Let me do that real quick. Do -do 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 -do. Oh, shush. You're whiny tonight. I lost my eraser. That's annoying. Thank you, dear. Yeah, I think I... I think I'm going to revise that for brawling. Yeah, it's not so much as that it's inconvenient, so much as that, yeah, I just... I like brawling to be... It, it is convenient. It doesn't match the tone of brawling and how long it takes. I mean, yes, you can get that one lucky blow that knocks somebody out. Yeah, and and you, you should have, have that an as an aspect. And you did have an epic success. Mm -hmm. But he's already rolling a knockout check from a brawl that high anyway, so... But I, I do think that brawling in, in sword and sorcery should be one of the highlights of the game because it's a great way to get combat in without anybody risking death. Yeah. And it should be fun. It, and it should be entertaining. And, and Yeah, and, it, match, and it, it should match the genre, which it's a prominent part of. I'll think about some of that tonight then. Same thing with the Western, by the way. If you ever run a Western with this setting, with this system, you would need a good brawling because I mean, if you look at the old classic Westerns, there's far more brawling than, than killing. I mean, ninety percent of the action is actually brawling in most of those movies. If you think about it, yeah, because once you pull the gun, somebody's going to get killed. Yeah, and that's usually left for the climax of the film. Okie dokie. So we will leave it there. I was just watching one with Audie Murphy, and it's like that's what pretty much all it was through most of the film was him brawling with characters, and he didn't kill anyone until the very last. Do you have a copy minutes. of the uh, Schwarzenegger, uh, Schwarzenegger Conan movies? No, uh, actually, I've been borrowing uh, Ray's for that whenever okay. I want them. She still hasn't seen those either, so we need to do that. Sometime. We really do need to have her watch the director's cut because it is superior by far to the original. <laughs> it adds five minutes to the end of the movie. And but it adds a lot of nuance. It adds five minutes you could cut, and I see why they cut it. The only thing it really adds is it shows you how he gets into the temple the second time. And it gives you a bit more of sympathy for the girl. Because you can kind of see how she's been brainwashed mm -hmm. thoroughly at that point. I mean, I think back to the scene where she's bowing before Conan, expecting him to give her orders. And the one thing I did like about it was that she's sitting there bowing to him, basically submitting to his will, and he's like, uh, no. <laughs> no, I don't know. And it very much matches his, you know, stand up, be on your own kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So. Well, that's kind of how I'm running Freywin to a lot of extent when it comes to these people she, we're encountering. She just doesn't get the whole submission thing. Yeah. Oh, <sighs> Okay. I'm sorry I kept yawning tonight, too. I don't know what was up with that. Hey, you made me yawn. <laughs> but I'm very glad that your doggy seems to at least be somewhat lovable to mine, just as long as he has his space. <laughs> Thank you for bringing him over. We need to socialize our own puppy more. Yeah, he needs to be socialized more. He's not handling other dogs well around me. And he needs to get over this insecurity. I mean, he was raised in a kennel all his life. He's never interacted with other people and other dogs. And he's handling people fine, but he seems to be still having issues with the dogs. So there's a comic that's been released by Image called Battle Pug. <laughs> and that the like fun. artwork is a guy riding a huge dire pug into battle. When I saw this, like I was like, this has got to be some kind of like... Joke? Joke one time thing, but uh -huh. no, there's currently one of these is a line series. <laughs> That sounds like fun. Yeah, it does. And we noticed there's actually a lot of uh, 
comics out now, they're all set basically in a D&D, more like a D&D &D world. Yeah. There's been some that are like taking Dragonlance and redrawing it as comics. There's, oh, sorry. There's one called uh, the Adventure Seekers or something we saw that the artwork looked pretty decent on. Mm -hmm. But also like, it was definitely geared for kids that were more like 15 to 20 because it has sort of that vague anime look to mm -hmm. it. Some of the Marvel titles are actually getting like to where they're airbrushing all their covers. Uh, there's one we saw called Aero. E A E R O. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure what the hero is supposed to be able to do or anything, but apparently it's a standalone title that Marvel started. And the very first cover page was an airbrushed piece of painting. I'm like, damn. Yeah, DC's been doing that for a while. And I think back to when like I first started collecting comics when I was a kid, and we had stuff that was just a little bit better than that primitive. I mean, we had stuff that was basically just a little bit better than Steve Ditko. Mm -hmm. I'm like, man, how it's changed. I remember when Liefeld came out, everyone was like, this is the best art ever! Despite the fact you never dry feet. But I like fell with a passion. I didn't like him then. I thought his stuff was incredibly over muscled and badly drawn, badly proportioned. Perspective was always screwed up. I'm still trying to figure out how uh, how Captain America can show both pecs and all six and all his all his six pack and yet actually be facing sideways. <laughs> but the reason I'm saying I noticed that a lot of this tends to be more sword and sorcery stuff. Yeah. Right? Like, there's uh, one I got back that I have not read yet called Coda. And Coda is basically, the caption for the comic book on uh, Comic Review was, High Fantasy is dead, what happens next? And basically you get the impression of some high fantasy thing has gone wrong in this world, mm -hmm. and you're now in like a sword and sorcery's low magic world and they're trying to survive. Um, really good ones, Rat Queens. I've not read anything of Rat Queens. Mm -hmm. I, I, I didn't get into the concept of it very much. What's it about? Well, basically it is, it is your typical D&D... Uh, adventure style group. I mean, basically a D&D style adventure group. It's all female. But it actually shows that what being a D&D style adventure group would actually be like if you actually had to do it. And ignoring the alignment system and actually looking at what you actually do. Because one of the things that the, the author points out is that when he was playing D&D is that, oh yeah, we're playing chaotic good and yet we're still going out there robbing tombs and basically being glorified brigands, stealing from people, uh, and so on and so forth. Because one of the ideas he has is this, that his GM threw at him, like towards the end of his uh, playing time before he started doing comics full time, was uh, they went out, took out a lich, a lich took his, you know, stormed his palace, robbed him blind, mm -hmm. and he sued them in court. Because he was a legal, tax-paying citizen of the kingdom, and even though he was lawful evil, he actually hadn't broken any laws. And so it's like snarky D and D, basically pointing out just how hypocritical being a quote good guy is when you actually do a lot of the jobs you do as an adventurer. <laughs> <laughs> and the rat queens basically are those people without the, the delusion and the hypocrisy of good alignment. They just do their jobs and really don't give a shit <laughs> without actually being assholes about it. They're not. Hurt, they're not out to actually kill or hurt. They're not evil, but they don't have any illusions about being good guys either. They're in it for the money. Okay. <laughs> and they're fiercely loyal to each other <laughs> and the friends they make. But, you know, hey, if we're hired to rob you blind, we're going to rob you blind. <laughs> But yeah, I thought that was a really neat tale. He says, you know, basically we went through the standard dungeon crawl adventure with this lich and we found out later he was a loyal tax paying citizen of the kingdom and suits in court. <laughs> so yeah, I thought that was hilarious. Because it never occurred to me, wait a minute, if he's undead and he's an intelligent, sentient being, then yeah, technically speaking, if he was a smart, super genius villain like he's supposed to be, why would he be doing anything illegal or evil in his own backyard? That's like pissing on your own bed. You think about it. No! He's going to be doing that shit outside the borders and be a nice, law-abiding, tax-paying, upstanding citizen in his own territory. <laughs> That's the smart way to do it. <laughs> okay. Can't do it there, little girl. All right. Well, thank you for coming out. No problem, man.